Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to be able to hold the stage, and I'm very glad um, that we have such a great motto for the conference. Um, and because everybody agrees that um, pro integration is a, is a good thing. So everybody here in, in different functions are working, have been working for a long time to I do believe that there is no convincing um, in the history of European integration um, looks back on five, six, six, one years. Let's not talk about um, the cultural aspects now, cultural history. I think the truth still holds that was um, often said that Europe in history, and I think it's often said that 50 years for integration is, um, for us, in the strictest sense of the word, nine years. In the case of Hungary, I believe, the, the, um, the most important that the advantages that we had uh, far outweigh the disadvantages. It's a different matter, obviously, that uh, the past nine years in, in Hungary have not been the most successful. I think it's known to everybody. Um, but you, among others, um, have been watching out um, to, to not to um, confuse cause with effect in, in Hungary. Um, I know there is a political and moral uh, crisis in, in Hungary, but it has nothing to do, had nothing to do with the fact um, that we became members of the European Union two years ago. Um, there were several other um, effects than in 2008, the so-called Hungarian crisis. Um, this also um, had um, a, a global crisis um, coming. So I don't want to talk about that really now. I do believe that the history of European in, um, integration, independent of that, is a success story. Um, and there are three things I would like to highlight, um, which on the one hand um, have been really important factors in this success, and on the other hand, um, in themselves, they pose problems. So what was the reason for success is at the same time a source of problems and difficulties. The first such factor um, is, is a lack of a balance between politics and economy. I think it's well known. European integration um, has this inherent problem um, from the beginning, and even before that, European integration is a political undertaking, um, primarily. There were political goals to be met to create a unity in Europe, to avoid wars. So, um, after all, it was a political undertaking. Um, the, the very first initiative, uh, even though it was, it took the form of completely economic uh, an undertaking. Um, 
which uh, and, and it was it was aiming at um, a very authoritative kind of um, kind of integration. But again, that was an initiative that said there needs to be an approach to find um, a cure for all the ills. Um, all the history cannot be uh, read out here, obviously, but the geniality, um, the ingeniousness of the whole thing was, was in, like, in effect um, um, that there should be unity, but some, uh, some point is that if, if some elites in some countries are not ready to um, give in to this unification, there needs to be an economic approach uh, through a different path. So the e economic integration have been progressing um, single market, single currency. So on the one hand, there is um, so economically speaking, things are progressing this really well despite all the difficulties. Um, at the same time, this led to a kind of um, imbalance. Um, the political union, as, as we speak, uh, as, as we say, may have made uh, um, some progress in, in, in the past years, but it was um, lagging behind uh, the economic uh, integration in certain respects. So there is a lack of balance. Um, and many people have highlighted this in many different ways. Um, political union is, um, is by its nature uh, more difficult than economic unification um, because uh, economy is, is more easy to control, uh, there, there are budgets and there are numbers. Pol politics are a little more sensitive and a little less uh, exact. And obviously it touches on the, um, the, uh, the sensitivities and identities of the member states. We, um, there are obviously different identities within the European Union in different member states and that might be a sensitive issue. Um, even within the economic sphere, there is a lack of balance. Just one example, um, the integration created a very nice, a very good, very effective trade policy that works really well within the European Union, but dealt less with the um, industrial policy or energy policy, um, um, even though all, everything started as an energy policy, but um, this comes back on the agenda um, only now, in the past three years. And one more thing, there is a single market. It's almost perfect um, with the currency as well, the single currency. But it turned out um, that um, there needs to be a lot more, a uh, lot stricter budgetary um, uh, policy and budgetary control. I, I can really only touch on these things very briefly. Um, it's a success. Um, that the European integration process has invented, discovered a system of institutions which stands without example and very successful at the same time. And there is also a system of norms, uh, legal norms, to be more precise, um, which um, the founders were aware of obviously, but it was um, much strengthened in the coming in some decades afterwards. So this, this chiseled, sophisticated system um, of, uh, of norms can help Europe over uh, problematic phases and can help the process to go on. Many people have said before that without the European Court of Justice, it, uh, Europe wouldn't be the same. If they hadn't created um, um, an institution, a forum that can uh, interpret the, um, the common norms, then Europe wouldn't be the same. And integration uh, would not be the same. We always come back to this, I know, and we've talked about this a lot of times. All this is a legal construct. This the rule of law is decisive in every single way, and 
And, and this is the most important factor in all this um, success, success story. But these institutions have become more and more uh, complex. The system of norms have become, uh, has become more and more uh, complicated. Um, and this is, a, this is a, also a factor in the distance between the, uh, the institutions and, um, and the ideas and people represented by the institutions. There is a, a, a huge rift. Um, the institutions and norms themselves, let's admit, um, are impossible to follow. Or we could perhaps add that the, the modern world is just like that in, in every single area. Um, and it's impossible to understand every single norm that surrounds us, obviously. Um, but this doesn't um, take away from the rift. It actually increased the rift between the institutions and the people that they represent. And um, there is a problem that is highlighted very often that has a lot to do with this. Um, this is why decisions are very often not legitimate. This is why people cannot identify with the different objectives uh, of the EU. Of the, prob with the problems, they do not feel um, any ownership. They don't understand what's going on. And this obviously has to do with the fact that there is no true European identity. There's no true European folk. And so this makes um, everything difficult with the political union um, and the legitimation of such a union. The third thing that's also a great success is the accession, is the uh, enlargement of, of the EU. We are 28 at the moment. There will be more. Many of us wish that, but we have to admit clearly um, that an institutional system on such a scale in all these countries is obviously different in 28 countries than it used to be in six. And the integration will be different uh, just uh, by the fact uh, that there is such a huge number of countries, it must be different. So there were six and nine and ten and fifteen. All this makes a difference. It's also doubtless um, that the economic and social, cultural, historical, political different differences um, um, are influenced negatively by this. There were different policies um, invented for the different different problems. Obviously. Um, the integration policy was uh, a response to the um, enlargement um, towards the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, maybe we will uh, touch more upon this uh, during the program. But, but the differences um, in economic um, the stages of development or phases of development could not be resolved. I'm certain that Europe is still um, a success story. It will remain so, in my opinion. But it stands without a doubt that there are problems. It's not a coincidence um, that some ideas pop up again and again with time, that they should be um, a narrow circle, um, whether it's the Eurozone now or something else. It's been seen, but there are a lot of ideas like that. Uh, other books are written on this topic, uh, so it's, it's um, a recurrent topic. We are too many. Um, it's not a coincidence, as I said, because this is one of the, um, the problems um, of European integration, which at the same time, I have to say, again and again, it's a success story because the original goal was to create a uh, unified Europe. Um, we didn't call it in enlargement uh, when we were talking about Central Europe. It was a re reunification of Europe. So um, our politicians saw it very clearly 
uh, that there would be an opportunity for that. It w was there very difficult to see this in the 60s, obviously, but um, the Amsterdam uh, Treaty um, made sure that the system would be open and those countries who couldn't join in the beginning could join later, and which actually happened, which is a huge success. Had you asked us in the 60s, um, I, I read in, you, in the newspapers, for example, we signed, we signed the Rome, Rome, uh, there was a, a Rome Treaty signed. Um, um, we didn't really think that this could actually have ramifications for us and we could be members. It's an old family story, really. My father told me back then um, that he would never live to see this, but I would. And so it became a success story, but it has its own problems and dilemmas. The true question is how we address these issues. There is a very optimistic uh, answer to this. Um, it's a, it's work in progress. It's, it's total, I know, but it's true. Integration is running at the moment. Um, the um, Article 136 is being amended, extended. Uh, the fiscal union um, um, is, is developing. So all, all these things are proceeding. We don't even know how successful it will be, really, because during the Hungarian presidency, the greatest um, emphasis was um, the fiscal union, which was not uh, managed to, we couldn't achieve at the time, but then um, was achieved later. One, one thing is certain. Uh, Two years ago, one, one year ago, everybody said, okay, Europe will, uh, will fall to pieces uh, and it will just uh, um, cease to be, but it never happened. I don't want to go into that. But this lack of balance, however, within uh, the economic uh, sphere should be addressed slowly and it is work in progress. There are um, efforts to this that should be strengthened. There is one um, um, site development of the whole um, issue. This um, state of imbalance between the politics and um, economy um, also represents on an international level. On the one hand, there is an economic giant which um, generates about 25% of the world's GDP. Um, it's still ahead of the US, just to reassure you. Um, if it's one, one of the greatest powers um, in the world today, if not the biggest. So there is international politics, defense um, politics uh, uh, in, in these fields. May not be, we may not be dwarfs, but we have a lot uh, smaller role. So there is a great imbalance. Um, finding this balance is ongoing, and um, I think the joint um, defense, um, the common uh, defense policy has been strengthened. I think there are results that we can see now. Um, the issues regarding Iran, for example, even though this has to do with a, a bit with the enlargement and the neighborhood policy. For example, the, the agreement between Belgrade and Pristina is, is one more important test. That all these steps show that the European Union um, has become an actor, internationally speaking. So, but this imbalance still remains. The next very difficult question is how this sort of European identity can be created, uh, how there should be a demos, a, a folk in Europe, a unified folk of people um, behind all this system. It's a very difficult issue, um, but there is one very important thing that I have to say. We shouldn't um, ditch um, the major, the, the core of, of 
uh, the European culture in politics, in culture, uh, in, in economy. There are norms and legal norms and moral norms between uh, us humans that should reign, should be the rule. Very often, we breach them openly, sometimes latently, obviously. Um, often say um, that being, um, being speaking in two tongues is very typical of the European Union. But Europe is not built on a, on a hierarchy. It's, it's not a vertical system. It's built on cooperation, mutual respect, mutual trust, and um, um, firm belief in norms. So the gist of all this, I want to say, which may be a problem, um, that if we keep certain um, fundamental principles in mind, we will definitely make progress in this field. What should be these principles? It may not be the most important thing, but one of the important things is that we don't always have to think in terms of concepts. Uh, maybe it's not the most important to have a federal Europe or to have um, or a, um, a Europe of member states natural um, Obviously, it's open for debate. But the most important thing is to stick to realities, how we can shape things in reality. It's doubtless that in certain areas, um, obviously, it's because we're saying um, that uh, the budgetary um, policies um, are something where we have to make progress and we have to deepen uh, the instruments that we have if we want to keep um, the single currency alive. We have to make uh, steps, even though it's not federal, we have to make steps in the field of um, the common defense policy as well. Our areas may have to deepen uh, integration, obviously. I am convinced, however, that hung Hungary's interests uh, are the same, um, and there are Central European interests in, the, in this respect. Uh, it is in the interest of Central Europe that this framework system should help the cooperation between the Central European countries, and it should help the rise of Central Europe. Um, and again, I would like to refer back to uh, the, um, the differences in the stages of development between the states at this point. At the same time, we have to take into consideration that in Europe there are some fundamental realities, undeniable realities, and these have become stronger and stronger in, uh, in recent times. That has several reasons, but this is a multifaceted world. It's not a homogeneous realm. This is not turning into the um, United States of America. Uh, as a result, we have to continue with the innovative thinking that the Founding Fathers, uh, almost 50 years ago, um, stood for. It's not, it's not India, it's not the United States and even and less China, it's not a homogeneous realm, not a kingdom. Uh, we have to have a system, a working system, um, which, even though it might be complex and difficult to understand, um, still give a really good representation and interpretation of uh, the basic treaties uh, within the EU. We can obviously debate um, further steps taken based on these, obviously, might be different, but um, what we can do is to keep to these, adhere to these. Without these norms, all the system wouldn't exist. We will, obviously, debate in the future as well about the different resolutions, about the different um, provisions in, in the treaties, but there will be a forum. Um, and we should be thankful for that. 
where all these debates can be settled, even if there are some um, touchy, sensitive is issues, and even if up to this date it's not clearly decided who is our arbitrator who says this is the decision, this is what happens. We have the European Court of Justice and, and um, but we do not know how these issues should be settled. If, if you read through um, the, the, the Lisbon um, sentence, you will see that it's not clear. There are other sentences as well uh, regarding the balance um, of um, judicial systems, but as long as we uh, respect each other. Um, and we know that there is a balance, that there needs to be a balance in, in cooperation. There won't be any big problems. There is the fourth, ar fourth article, um, second paragraph. We have to respect the equality of, of member states. And we have to respect the national identity of the member states. At the same time, the text also says that um, that the political constructs need to be respected. Obviously, you could also read straight away the third paragraph, uh, which also um, says that member states should help each other and cooperate. It's a very, very difficult thing. There aren't any unilateral approaches. If we um, if we turn turn this into political um, prejudice and judgment, the system won't work. We're not talking about just Hungary now. We are talking about uh, wider issues. The fact that some fundamental principles uh, should be untouchable. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. One such a fundamental principle is that the treaties, uh, the EU treaties, need to be adhered to. Um, equal treatment is perhaps the most important of principles. Without this, the system um, would dis disintegrate slowly, but definitely. Transparency is difficult, I know, because the system is very difficult, it's very difficult to follow, but um, transparency it needs to be maintained as far as possible. And whatever mechanisms we come up with, we, we need to be careful that the treaties need to be adhered to, and there needs to be legal securities which guarantee this um, state of law within the European Union. So more of us keep saying, more often actually, that there needs to be balance between the EU institutions and the member states, but there needs to be balance, and this is also in, in the, the EU treaty, between the EU institutions. Every single institution, institution has their tasks. And if we mix up political ideologies with, um, with um, European issues, then, then we endanger the system. There are forums which are not political and much less um, about party politics. They decide on, on a legal basis. This is what makes the system work. This is why the system was able to solve all uh, serious problems up to now. This is why it could move on. Um, there needs to be a trust in us all as well, a respect, understanding, and, and we need to be informed and need to be listened to. And there needs to be fair treatment, a due, a due, which is a part of every due process. Obviously, this. It, it may be a bias that I have, um, um, but I do believe that in the end, this system can only be maintained with 
a clearly understandable um, and a practicable judicial legal system. Whatever we talk about within EU, this should always be the basis of our ideas. Pro integrationum, I, I told you this, uh, I think it's a great motto. I do believe that it is in Hungary's best national interest to uh, apply the principle of pro integratione for, um, the, for example, in, in Hungarian national politics. Let's see, let's have a look at, for example, the, the neighboring countries and the Hungarian communities there. Um, our connections to these people, these populations, or the trade relations between uh, Hungary and, and, and these, uh, this diaspora. I think is a, it is in our fundamental interest. Um, I already mentioned that it is a very important framework for Central Europe, um, for the rise of this region in, in, in the future, in the 21st century, as we usually say, Europe, Europe's role can only be maintained relatively well if we have a well-functioning clear integration, incorporation with respect to others. Thank you.